Well, the fantastic thing about the fact that you um, were running just a few minutes late today is I got to hear two really brilliant speakers. Thank you both so much for your words this morning. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I want to welcome you to my electorate of Sydney. We're right in the heart of my electorate today. And I know many of you have travelled from uh, all around Australia and, of course, from overseas as well. Uh, so um, I hope you enjoy everything that Sydney has to offer during your conference. I want to make special mention of Professor Christine Duffield, the President of the Australian College of Nursing, and Adjunct Professor Kylie Ward, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Australian College of Nursing. Um, Janine, I thought your, um, your presentation about uh, uh, indigenous um, nurses and midwives and more importantly what what we can do to support workforce measures and the patients that benefit from those workforce measures was fantastic and Robert I really enjoyed um, the the fundamental notion that if you put yourself in the place of the patient and think about what kind of care would I want for myself or my family it makes a lot of these next steps duck moments as you said when I was first asked to address your conference on Make Change Happen, I, I really wondered why you would get someone from outside the nursing profession to do that because each of you do it absolutely every day in the work that you do. And I think people occasionally get a little bit frustrated with politics and wonder whether politics ever makes anything happen, particularly when, uh, you know, 10 years after first saying that we needed a real bipartisan policy on climate change. We're not there yet. And you see many examples like that along the way. But it certainly is the reason that most people who go into political life go into political life. And um, uh, in my time, almost 20 years in the parliament now, uh, comprising seven terms in parliaments, six ministerial roles in government, six different shadow ministerial portfolios in opposition and three children along the way, uh, I have actually seen some really important and big changes in our community. We've seen, of course, the apology to the stolen generation. We saw um, the fact that Australia survived the global financial crisis in, in a way much better than most other comparable countries. Um, we saw the introduction of needs-based funding for our schools and probably the most important change of our lifetimes, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So on the one hand, despite the frustrations, you do see great opportunities for change and, and great changes actually occur. So I had a little think about what the, the um, key characteristics of those big reforms were, what we had to do to make those big reforms happen. And I thought um, comparing that with the work that you've done through your terrific white paper on nursing impact in health and aged care reform produced by the college and launched by the college with my colleague Catherine King uh, last October was a really good way to start. I think the green paper, white paper process is a fantastic way of really focusing the mind of uh, on what, as a profession, you would like to see changed. I thought um, the, the list of rec uh, recognise the nursing profession's role, invest in policy platforms that enable the full participation of the nursing profession, ensure the nursing voice is heard in strategic policy debates and reform developments, recognise the value of nurse-led innovation, support nurses to work to their full scope and expand the scope where necessary and acknowledge the pivotal role of nurses in setting standards of care. I think they are actually fantastic goals. And if you, as a college and as a profession, achieve those goals, that's terrific. But how do you translate what's on the page from the, the green paper and white paper to what happens every day in the settings that you're working in? That's really the key challenge, isn't it? So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what I see as the key to, um, to making change happen. And I think the first thing is be really clear on what you want. Now, you've gone through the process with the white paper of identifying a whole range of changes that you want. But those, um, I think uh, you have to be very clear when you're identifying change 
to separate out process changes from outcomes changed. I think it's always really important to ask yourself, why do I want this change? What difference will it make in people's lives? And uh, really, it's what Robert was talking about uh, when he was looking at the, the outcomes that his grandmother wanted for her life. What difference do you make in a person's life if these changes happen? So, um, consultation with the profession, involving the profession in co-design of new um, health systems, uh, new approaches, um, that's a first step and it's important to lobby government for that first step. But what you've got to focus on is the outcome. What difference does this make, this um, involvement of the profession, uh, the consultation with the profession, what difference does that make um, at the hospital bedside, in the community nursing setting, uh, what difference does it make to the human being in the middle of the story? The white paper identified a number of really critical issues facing the Australian health system, including inequities in health, uh, lower life expectancy for people living in rural and remote areas, uh, 10 years less on average for Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islanders peoples. Um, it identified the problem like the big trends of globalisation of disease, including antimicrobial resistance, which I can tell you when I was the health minister, if there was anything that was really keeping me up at night, it was wondering what comes next uh, if, we really, if we really drop the ball on um, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the increase in costs of care and what that means for government ability and consumers' ability to actually provide the highest standard of care that we'd like to provide. And uh, another area that the white paper identified was the labour market issues in the nursing profession, including possible shortfalls of nursing in the future, of nurses in the future. So I, I think um, keeping in mind the processes that you want to follow, those very specific uh, problems that you've identified that the profession's facing, the next step is obviously how do we solve these problems and how do we solve them always keeping the, the human being uh, in the centre of our solutions focus. So I think step one, be clear on what you want. Step two has to be do your homework and set yourself a target. Now, we're not alone in Australia. There's um, a lot of parts of Australia that are doing something really exceptionally well, or on the other hand, something really exceptionally badly, we have to learn from that. We have to be clear-eyed and face it. There are health systems around the world that are doing things really exceptionally well or really exceptionally badly, and we have to learn from that as well. And f from that learning, we have to be really clear in setting targets. Nothing happens if you don't measure it. There is no point in just doing your best. We have to set targets, but we don't pluck those targets out of the air. We do our research, we set them scientifically, we need to make sure they're achievable, but they're a stretch. If they're too easily achievable, there's no point to them. If they're impossible, you're just demoralising people and setting yourself up for failure. So set targets and measure them. And um, the, the example, my, um, my favourite example really of the, the target setting process was um, when I had the homelessness portfolio and we set the target of halving the rate of homelessness by 2020. Um, a lot of people said to us, why don't you set a target of eliminating homelessness by 2020? Because that's really what you want to do in your heart, isn't it? Like, there's no way that you want a single person to be homeless. We thought, would anyone believe us? if we said we were going to eliminate homelessness by 2020? Probably not, because that's probably too much of a stretch. If we said we're going to eliminate homelessness by 2020, uh, 2050, well, what would be the point? Like Most of us would never see that uh, target. We'd never be measured against it. So we set a stretch target that was achievable in a time frame that we could be measured against. Um, sadly, that target doesn't exist any longer, the, the um, following government abandoned it. But the, the point is to have a target that is achievable but a stretch. And then um, always remember 
the human being in the middle of that uh, work as well. Some of the most important um, motivators I had in continuing to do what can sometimes be quite a frustrating job was to meet the, the people whose lives had changed because of an intervention we made as a government, someone who'd moved into a new house we built, who was using a new homelessness service that we created. In health, I met, when I had the health portfolio, I met so many people that had, for example, benefit, benefited from a medicine, a new medicine we'd put on the pharmaceutical benefits schedule, or um, had visited one of the new cancer centres we built in regional areas, or had benefited from one of the um, breast care nurses or prostate nurses we'd funded. I mean, the people who tell you the stories of the difference that their, um, their individual story has, uh, you know, the, the pixel in the huge picture of the health system, the pixel that is their story is so important to, to understand. So it's not any good having targets unless you've got a clear implementation plan. You really need a detailed plan. If, you, if you're here and you want to get here, is it a straight line to get there? Do you expect that there'll be a struggle in the beginning and then things will take off? You need to plot your path and say, where do I expect to be in the whole time of this implementation? Um, you, you, it, it's like uh, the you know, crazy fight I have with my kids and their homework all the time. Y you don't leave it to measure your success till the night before the target that you've set. You actually have to go, I'm halfway through the time I've set to achieve this target. Have I achieved half of what I want to do? If I haven't achieved, achieved half, why not? Did I expect to be further along the path when I was halfway through? So you need to be very clear about um, how you um, not just set targets, but how you monitor progress against those targets the whole way through. Because you, again, don't get change if you leave these things to chance. The fourth thing that I wanted to say to you is don't give up. Because if you get halfway through and you're not halfway towards your target, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you can't get there. It means that you have to work out what's not working, work out what is working, redouble your efforts on what is working and reformulate your approach to not what is not working. Um, if people had given up, if people in this room had given up, uh, during the 30 years of campaigning for a national disability insurance scheme. We wouldn't have it now. These things sometimes take long, uh, a long time. They're sometimes frustrating. You'll sometimes have two steps forward and one step back. But persistence in achieving your goals is absolutely, in, absolutely vital to making change happen. You could say the same about pay equity. Um, we've been fighting for that. We've, we've, we've been given uh, legal... Um, pay equity as women three times um, and we're still fighting for it in practice but it is something that is worth persisting with. And the last step that I wanted to um, urge you to consider was to stop and smell the roses. Because sometimes the change that we want to see takes a long time to implement, sometimes it is frustrating and imperfect uh, it can be tempting just to take the victories along the way and say, okay, what's next? I'm so determined to see the next step that I, I'm committed to that we don't celebrate our victories. I think any, any person or any organisation that doesn't take time to um, celebrate the victories along the path, uh, well... It's hard to keep an organisation motivated, it's hard to keep yourself motivated if you don't celebrate the victories that you have. And I've seen, um, even during my years of working with the college, some really significant gains that you've made because of the lobbying of the college, uh, because of the organisation of you as members, and I think it's important to, to celebrate and to acknowledge that. Um, I've got every confidence that you as individuals are making change every day where you work, in what you do, and I've got every confidence that the college uh, as a group will continue to lead change in the, um, in the areas that you set your sights on. Thank you.